Let's explore some descriptive statistics such as mean, median, and mode, which may already be familiar to many of you. These three statistics are measures of central tendency in statistics that help describe the center of a data set. Let's start with the mode. The mode is simply the statistics that represents the most common value in a data set. Consider the table displayed here. Suppose in the first column, we have shoe sizes ranging from small to extra large. And in the second column, we have the corresponding number of pairs of shoes sold. So out of a total of 40 pairs of shoes sold, which size is the most common? It's the medium size with 25 pairs sold. Therefore, the mode of this data set is the medium size. In summary, the mode is the value that appears most frequently in the data sets. A key characteristic of the mode is that it is largely affected by extreme values. For example, imagine the number of shoes sold for the small size increases to 15, but the numbers for the other sizes remain unchanged. The overall distribution of the data set barely shifts. Now, let's say the sales for the small size increased further to 20 and the sales for the large size bumped up to 21. The differences between the numbers are relatively small. Then imagine the sales for the extra large size drop to zero. Since the number of sales for the extra large size is relatively small compared to other shoe sizes, it's an extreme value. Although we have an extreme value in our data set, the medium size remains the mode, illustrating the most robustness to extreme values. As demonstrated in this example, the mode is primarily used for categorical data. Imagine we gathered height data from a sample of 1,000 individuals, recording measurements to two decimal places, and constructed a data table using Excel. However, in this table, it becomes challenging to pinpoint values with significant frequencies like the medium size with 25 sales from the previous example. If we extend our measurements to 3 or even 4 decimal places, we will likely observe lower frequencies for each value. Consequently, the mode becomes more applicable for categorical data sets with a small number of distinct categories. Additionally, it's worth noting that a data set might exhibit multiple modes. If the number of sales for large shoes jump to 25, both medium and large sizes will represent modes within the data sets. The median represents the central value of a data set when its data are arranged in order, regardless of whether they are sorted in ascending or descending order. For instance, if we consider a data set consisting of natural numbers from 1 to 9, the median would be 5, the value at the center. In this example, our data is already sorted. However, if the data set is not sorted, we need to sort it first before determining the median. Now let's consider another data set comprising natural numbers from 1 to 10 with an even number of data points. There's no single value at the center of the data set. In such instances, the median is calculated as the average of the two central values. Similar to the mode, the median is less sensitive to changes in observed values or the presence of extreme values. Consider a new data point 99 next to 9. Obviously, it's an extreme value. However, despite this extreme value, the median of our updated data set remains at 5.5, still in close proximity to the original median of 5. Calculating the median involves identifying the relative position of the central value within a sorted data set. Moreover, even when values change from 1 to 1.1, 2 to 2.1, 3 to 3.1, etc., etc., the median is less sensitive unless its relative position changes and it remains close to its original value, 5. It's one of the key characteristics of the median. The median is a descriptive statistic used frequently in both categorical and quantitative data. I also use the median quite often at work as a data scientist. For instance, when faced with extreme values within a data set, and seeking a statistic that best represents its central tendency, I use the median. 
The median serves as an excellent measure of central tendency, particularly adept at handling data sets with extreme values. Now, let's delve into another statistic, the arithmetic mean, often referred to simply as the average or just mean. The arithmetic mean is the most commonly used type of mean in real life. It entails summing up all the values in the data set and dividing the sum by the total count of numbers. This statistic measuring central tendency is widely utilized due to its simplicity and intuitive understanding. However, because it involves summing up all values, the arithmetic mean can be influenced by both the presence of extreme values and changes in the data set's values. For example, suppose we have natural numbers from 1 to 8, with one large value 999. In this scenario, it is evident that 5 represents the central tendency of the data sets, as it is the number located at the center. However, when we calculate the central tendency using the arithmetic mean, the extreme value of 999 significantly influences the summation in the mean calculation, resulting in a mean value around 100. Consequently, the arithmetic mean of the data set is too large to accurately represent its central tendency. This is one of the limitations of the arithmetic mean. To mitigate this issue, we can use a trim mean, which calculates the mean without including extreme values. Once again, the arithmetic mean can be calculated by summing up all the values in a data set and dividing the sum by the total count of numbers. Now let's delve into the weighted mean. The arithmetic mean serves as a generalized form of the weighted mean. The calculation method for the weighted mean involves incorporates weight into the equation, as depicted below. By adjusting certain parameters within this formula, we can derive the equation used for calculating the arithmetic mean. Essentially, the equation for the arithmetic mean is a broader interpretation of the equation for the weighted mean. In contrast to the arithmetic mean, the weighted mean explicitly incorporates weights into its calculation. Within a data set, some data might be more important than others and vice versa. For example, grades for a full-year course might be considered more important than grades for a half-year course. You know, we are happier when we get an A plus for a full-year course than we get an A for a half-year course. Similarly, you might be happier if you get an A plus for a mandatory course than if you get an A plus for other courses you need to take for breadth requirements. The calculation method for the weighted mean is also very simple. The only difference between the two equations is that the equation below includes W's. The W's within the equation represents weights, signifying the relative importance of each data point. The scale of these weights is entirely subjective. You can adjust them to reflect the importance assigned to each data point. Whether you scale the weights so that their sum equals zero or assign arbitrary values, the key requirement is to divide the sum of the products of the data and weights by the sum of the weights. Now let's consider how we derive the equation using the formula below. When all weights from W1 to Wn are set to 1, we obtain the numerator of the equation. If all weights are set to 1, given n weights, the sum of weights becomes n, indicating each data point contributes equally to the calculation of the weighted mean. Thus, it becomes evident that the arithmetic mean is indeed a generalized version of the weighted mean. So far, we've explored four distinct types of statistics used to measure the central tendency of a data set. Now, we turn our attention to the final measure of central tendency, the geometric mean. Unlike the arithmetic mean and weighted mean, which involve addition and division, the equation for the geometric mean entails multiplication and root extraction. While the geometric mean might not be as commonly used in the arithmetic mean in real life, it holds significant relevance in certain fields. Personally, working in the financial sector, I find myself using the geometric mean almost daily. However, its frequency of use may vary among data scientists in different domains. The geometric mean is particularly valuable for calculating the average rate of change or growth over time. For instance, it's commonly employed to determine the average profit rate of a specific stock over a period. 
such as 5 days with returns of 1%, 3%, 5%, and even 10%. You might initially consider using the arithmetic mean for calculating average investment returns, but the geometric mean is preferred when dealing with rates of change over time. Once again, the geometric mean is useful for data sets with values that multiply together, such as growth rates, ratios, or rates of return. To calculate the geometric mean, we begin by multiplying all the values in our data sets, then take the nth root of the product, where n is the number of data points we have. However, can the value inside the root be less than zero? Technically, yes, but generally, no. So let's consider a case where the product of our data is less than zero. For instance, suppose my investment profit rate is negative for three days, say negative one, negative three, and negative five. Let's substitute negative one, negative three, and negative five into x1, x2, and x3. Then the product of these numbers results in negative 15, which is less than zero. Consequently, the negative number goes inside the root, making the calculation more complex. To handle this, when some of our data points are less than 0, we add 1 to each value, like 1 plus x1, 1 plus x2, and so forth. Suppose we have 5 data points within a data set. We calculate the product of 1 plus x1 to 1 plus x5, and then take the fifth root of this product. After obtaining the fifth root, we subtract 1 to derive the proper geometric mean. It's worth noting that we subtract 1 outside the root rather than subtracting 1's inside the root. So when calculating the average return of a stock, each daily return value is incremented by 1. If a daily return is 1%, it becomes 1.01. .01. Similarly, if a daily return is 10%, it becomes 1.1. .1. Let's practice with examples. In class 1, there are 30 students, and in class 2, there are 50 students. The average score for class 1 is 70, while for class 2, it's 80. Again, the average score for students in class 1 is 70, and for class 2, it's 80. How do we determine the average score for both classes combined? Let's examine how the average score of 70 for class 1 was computed. The left-hand side of the equation is 70. The right-hand side of the equation involves dividing some value by 30, representing the number of students in class 1. Let's denote class 1 as x and class 2 as y. The numerator of the fraction is the sum of x1 to x30, each representing the score for an individual student. On the other hand, the average score for class 2, 80, is determined by summing up the scores of y1 to y50 and dividing by 50, representing the size of class 2. That's how we obtain the average values of 70 and 80. Now how do we calculate the average score for both classes combined? Hmm, let's denote the average score for the combined class as mu. The total number of students in both class 1 and class 2 is 30 plus 50, which equals 80. The numerator is the sum of the scores of every individual student in both class 1 and class 2. Hence, the sum of these two values is the numerator for the right-hand side of the equation. Got it? So how do we calculate the sum of these two values? The sum of x1 to x30 equals 70 times 30, and the sum of y1 to y50 equals 80 times 50. Thus, the numerator equals 70 times 30 plus 80 times 50, and we can calculate the value for mu. For now, we're gonna skip the actual calculation. Now let's move on to problem 2. To solve this problem, we'll need to understand how to calculate the weighted mean, similar to the example with Grace mentioned earlier. Let's say we received an A plus for Korean class, a B for English class, and unfortunately a C plus for computer class, and a B for science class. Each class corresponds to 3 credits, 2 credits, 4 credits, and lastly 2 credits respectively. Given that the GPA ranges from 4.5 to 2.5 for an A plus to C plus, 
What is the average GPA for all subjects? Since the credits vary for each class, calculating the weighted mean is the appropriate approach. Remember, for the weighted mean, we divide the sum of the products of weights and data by the sum of weights. What are the weights in this problem? In this problem, the weights are the credits representing the importance of each class. Thus, the denominator is the sum of 3 for Korean class, 2 for English class, 4 for computer class, and lastly 2 for science class. The numerator is calculated as 3 times 4.5 for an A+, plus, plus 2 times 3 for a B, plus 4 times 2.5 for a C+, plus, plus 2 times 3 for a B. We can then calculate the weighted mean using the numerator and the denominator. We'll skip the actual calculation once again. Now let's move on to the next problem, which involves calculating the geometric mean. Consider the inflation rates over 5 years, 3%, 5%, 6%, 2%, and 4% respectively. Oh, they're the weird looking inflation rates, and it's not good for the economy. Anyway, how do we calculate the average inflation rates when they fluctuate up and down? Since we have 5 data points, we're going to take the 5th root of the product, which includes 1 plus 0.03, 1 plus 0.05, 1 plus 0.06, 1 plus 0.02, and lastly, 1.04. Don't forget to subtract 1 after taking the 5th root. If you calculate this, you'll get the geometric mean of the interest rates. The final problem involves finding the median of a data set. Earlier, I mentioned that finding the median is the same as identifying the central data point. However, before we search for the central data point, we must first sort the data set. Let's arrange the data in ascending order. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 9. Therefore, 5 is the median. Now suppose the data set does not include the number 5. In this case, our sorted data set would be 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, and 9. Here we have two values located at the center. In such instances, we calculate the average of the two numbers, which is also 5. 